at a, a, I teach in I teach in an Australian university that has a uh, branch campus in Malaysia, so it's Monash University. Um, I teach primary creative writing, but um, my area of research is in um, is in the Gothic and horror, and uh, I look at both Eastern and Western uh, materials. Um, so, um, so my topic today is on the monstrous famine of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and um, yeah, so the slides are mainly just as uh, they're more cues uh, rather than uh, full fledged sort of information. So I hope um, as I am going to, you'll be able to follow what I'm saying um, with, the, with the very minimal information on the slide. Uh, but I will try to elaborate as much as possible what is, uh, what is uh, stated in the slides. Okay, so um, this is the Southeast Asian map, as we all know. Um, uh, of course, uh, the way in which the Southeast Asian map is now demarcated is uh, due to post-colonial history and the demarcation of the various countries into, into the respective nation states. Uh, but uh, before the advent of the major religions in this part of the world, uh, Southeast Asia was primarily uh, an animi animistic region. Um, um, its focus is on spirit uh, is on uh, uh, interaction with the spiritual world. Um, so, uh, as as a lot of uh, historians of Southeast Asia stated, Southeast Asia is very much a, a, a realm of the spirits. And even though um, Islam and Buddhism and Catholicism have uh, infiltrated this part of the world and have spread. Uh, Quite intensely uh, throughout the region, it's never really sort of entirely exorcised uh, uh, belief in the spiritual um, world. Um, so much so that even the most sort of staunch believers, for example, in Islam or in Catholicism, still continue to have some form of respect for the uh, for the animistic past and for the apparent uh, sp spirits that dwell in this part of the world. Um, in Malaysia, for example, you have witch doctors, you know, that um, sort of intermix Islam, Islamic teachings and animistic rituals when it comes to uh, dealing with so-called um, spirits from the animistic past. So these are prohibited in Islam. Um, you can see that the very existence of such witch doctors uh, in this part of the world still attests to the fact that belief in the spiritual world has not entirely been uh, uh, jettisoned. Uh, it's still very much a part of our culture. Um, there's no sort of extreme uh, move to, uh, to stem them out uh, because it's very much a part of the cultural imagination of this part of the world. So you can see how there's this uh, ideological tension between two sort of worldviews operating in this part of the world. So um, Buddhism um, came to this part of the world in the 13th century, and then followed by Hinduism in the 14th century and Islam in the 15th century. Um, so this uh, this this religious uh, and of course Christianity, I think, came around the time the same time as well, uh, maybe slightly later in terms of its spread. But uh, these religions, uh, they came and they they became. Tr I mean, when they came and they tried to and, and they started to sort of spread, uh, they did see the animistic practices and beliefs as a sort of an alternative and even threatening worldview, which is why for many of these uh, this cosmogonies, uh, the attempt was to try and silence um, the animistic past. Um, um, I will talk about this a bit more later, but uh, there was a sort of indirect uh, concerted attempt to try and silence uh, the animistic past because they posed a threat to uh, these worldviews, especially with the monotheistic religions. With the non-monotheistic religion, with the pantheistic religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, it's more of a negotiation with this animistic past, um, trying to sort of subjugate this past uh, to uh, to be to, to subscribe to Buddhism and Hinduism, for example, as opposed to monotheistic religions like Islam and Catholicism, which uh, indirectly try very hard to continue to, to completely silence uh, this animistic past. Um, so, but as I mentioned, you know the past. This this past is never completely uh, 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 exorcised. Uh, they still very much uh, form a part of the cultural imagination of this part of the world. Uh, and one of the things that continue to exist uh, as part of that cultural imagination is the belief in monstrous creatures. Um, one of which is the monstrous feminine of Southeast Asia. Okay, so um, in this part of the world, there is a creature. Um, which is, which is always female. It goes by different names. It has different origins, uh, respective to the different uh, nation states uh, uh, to which it belongs. But uh, 
okay, like for example, they are, what their names are, for example, in, uh, in Thailand, they are known as uh, either the Mainak or the Nangnak. Um, in uh, Indonesia, they are known as the uh, Untilana or the Matiana. In uh, Malaysia, they are known as the Pongkiana. And in Thailand, I mean, sorry, in Philippines, they are known as the Tiana. So they all have different names and they all have different sort of origins, um, but they essentially are a similar type of creature um, in that they are all women who have turned undead uh, because they died at childbirth. So that's how they became these creatures. So, uh, so essentially, uh, that, that's their origin. Uh, in terms of uh, their, their origin, origin as in, you know, the, the, the myths, the stories uh, surrounding these creatures, Unfortunately, um, Southeast Asia has a very lousy <laughs> history of uh, keeping records of its mythology. Many of them continue to exist even until today in only in oral tradition. So there's um, little to no written record of um, the mythologies uh, uh, from this part of the world. Unlike, for example, in China or Japan, where there's a very rich tradition of recording um, its mythological histories. Um, in Southeast Asia, there's, there's almost um, none. I mean, if there is, it's, it's very, very limited. So, for example, in Malaysia, um, stories about the Pontiana only began to be recorded in the 20th century. Um, and this is talking about hundreds of, hundreds of years um, in between um, uh, from, from the time um, the, the, the West first came into contact with this part of the world until the 20th century. You know, it was only in the 20th century and it was done, the, the recording was actually done by British Orientalists. Uh, people who were interested in the culture of this part of the world and started collecting stories uh, about uh, this part of the world's myth, um, and then later in films. So, because of that, many of the, sto the stories uh, re relating to the origins of this uh, of, of, of this part of the world's folk horror, for example, have become lost, or they are only in piece meals. Um, so uh, there's very little record of, for example, how this. Uh, what, what, what were the first stories about these women who turned undead? Um, who were they you know, in, in, in mythology? Uh, what exactly happened and, and why they became the way they did? You know, what was the sort of situation that caused their death uh, to then transform them into undead? All of this information is, is no longer uh, possible. All we have is that these are women who turned undead because they died at childbirth. Usually it's the birth of their first child. And, and, uh, and subsequently, after turning undead, their target would be women who are also childbearing because uh, of alleged jealousy uh, for not being able to be the mother that these uh, childbearing mothers are, are, are going to be. And so they attack uh, both the childbearing mother as well as the child that they are bearing in order to destroy them by uh, feeding on the unborn child through a kind of proboscis um, like uh, appendage, so it's like, like this mosquito thing is sort of sticking stick into the, the stomach of the, of the child-bearing mother to suck out the, uh, the child. It's such gory stuff, all right? But um, <laughs> typical of gothic, I suppose. Um, so, um, yeah, so, but as I said earlier, these women. Uh, these creatures, or you know, they they are not the they, they are the same creature, but at, but at the same time they are not the same because they all are sort of different in terms of the origins. So, for example, in Thailand, the Nangna, which is this type of monstrous feminine, she actually is believed to be a real person in history. So she is apparently a woman who had lived during the reign of uh, uh, the the fifth King Rama. So that would probably be around the, uh, the 18th century, sorry. So it's believed that she's a real person um, who embodied a kind of a perfect uh, Thai uh, femininity. And, uh, and, and it is because she refused to uh, let go of the living world in order to continue to serve her husband that she stayed on as an undead in order to uh, render service to her husband. And in that sense, she is the perfect Thai uh, wife. The, the perfect Thai woman, uh, whereas in uh, the in the case of the uh, Malaysian and the Indonesian as well as the uh, Filipino uh, creature, they are uh, truly mythological creatures. They are creatures from uh, the, the the regions uh, mythic past. So they are they are uh, monsters of folklore, unlike the case of uh, the Thai version, uh, which is apparently a real woman or believed to be at least uh, modeled after a real woman. 
Um, and in Thailand, the Nang Nang is actually a revered figure. So you can actually find shrines in Thailand that is dedicated to her. So she's not uh, entirely a monster, monster. She's actually kind of a deity figure and that women who cannot give birth would go to to seek some form of um, some form, some form of, uh, 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 I mean, both will, will, will go and give some form of supplication to, to this uh, to this figure in order to be able to bear children. Um, um, whereas, you know, in the in in Malaysia and Indonesia, this this type of creature is uh, is um, is is, uh, is attributed. I mean, attributed attributed to be a, a, a an evil, monstrous being. You know, who comes out at night um, to search for women who are bearing children in order to destroy both mother and, and child. Um, but because there is so scarce information regarding the mythology of these uh, of these women, what we have, as I said, is based on uh, it's still based on oral tradition and that, that is why you know information about these women they are, they are very piecemeal and because they are also very ambiguous due to the lack of information, 20th century reimagination of these creatures have tended to become very varied. So in some cases, these women have become vampires. In other cases, they, they are ghosts. Uh, in, in, some, in, in, in many films, for example, from Malaysia and Indonesia made of these creatures, they have had uh, Western creatures sort of a, uh, um, a Western creatures sort of a, a constitution sort of imposed on them. So for example, in, in Malaysia, some of the uh, films uh, relating to the monstrous families have them uh, featured as uh, creatures with fangs, you know, which is completely alien to the mythology of this part of the world. Because this is again how uh, the Western uh, idea of the monster has been imposed to uh, onto onto the uh, onto this particular Eastern creature simply because the vampires are undead, and this this sort of monstrous uh, famine are also undead. So you know, why not just you know bring the two together because. Uh, it makes for good movies and you can you can sell them internationally because everybody in the world knows the vampire but nobody knows the Pontianak. So let's give the Pontianak some kind of a vampiric quality and you know voila we have a modernized uh, Pontianak for for a contemporary audience. Uh, but of course you know all that uh, only ends up uh, diluting the authenticity um, of the mythology of this part of the world and it's only in the 20th, 21st century sorry that we begin to see that that practice being reversed. I think probably because uh, there's a lot more uh, conscientious effort now to not uh, uh, impose Western ideas onto uh, non-Western films uh, and to keep uh, uh, non-Western films, you know, to some extent uh, authentic to its uh, cultural representation. So that whole practice of imposing Western ideas onto Eastern works, you know, have absolutely become uh, less less uh, prominent uh, as opposed to the 20th century when these sort of practices were quite rife. So there is there's been a lot of uh, uh, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of revival in in terms of uh, being true to uh, the the regions uh, 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 being true to the regions uh, folklore and, and mythology in the 21st century that we do not see in the 20th century. But I'll I'll talk about that a bit more once we look at some of the films that have been made. In relation to this monstrous feminine uh, later in the presentation. So, um, so say for the Thai variety, as I mentioned, the rest are the other the the they are the other monstrous feminine version relating to this creature. Uh, as I said, they are evil beings, you know, they are they are monsters, you know, out to target uh, living humans and, and destroy them. Uh, as I say, it's uh, unlike Unlike these other versions, the Thai variety, she's not so much a monster, but more of a de deified figure. Uh, she is uh, she is not out to destroy women, but she's she became the undead in order to continue to serve her husband uh, beyond death. And in that sense, she is uh, viewed as uh, an embodiment of purity and embodiment of uh, a woman par excellence, as opposed to the other uh, similar type of. Uh, creature that is viewed primarily as all that that is configured primarily as monstrous creatures. Um, right, I've also mentioned uh, the next point. How come I'm going, I'm speaking ahead of myself. Um, okay, so it's in the 20th century that we begin to see these creatures actually becoming uh, recorded. Uh, they actually are introduced into recorded history or written history. 
firstly by orientalists and later on by film. Um, and because um, a lot of information uh, by the time that they are introduced into written history have been lost, uh, there is only very little information that could be introduced into written history. So for example, in the case of the Pontiana, which I'm most familiar with because um, I'm from Malaysia, uh, the only sort of extent uh, information that has entered into uh, written history are spells uh, uh, that are created in order to protect oneself from the attack of the Pontiana. So it's only one or two sort of a a uh, short verse uh, regarding how you protect yourself from Pontiana. Uh, that is the extent of the folklore that uh, that Malaysia has inherited in terms of you know their folk monsters, um, and, and that is all that's been recorded. And with and even then, uh, even with the recording, there are also problems because the the person who was uh, recording that in his I mean who was sort of writing that down. Uh, was struggling a bit with the language, so the the whole process becomes unclear as to precisely what the Pontiana is. So on one hand, uh, this orientalist, his name is R.O. Winstead, uh, he says that the Pontiana is the mother, uh, is the mother of the unborn child. But but then uh, in a, in the same way, he will also later on say that the Pontiana is the child of the undead mother. So there is also a sense of that the 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 Orientalist himself is struggling in terms of precisely who or what uh, ultimately uh, represents or embodies the Pontianak figure. And because of that, it only creates more confusion uh, for, for uh, later uh, scholars and thinkers about uh, of, of folklore as to precisely what the Pontianak is. So there's, I suppose there's a good and there's a positive and negative sort of a, uh, effect or consequence from it. Uh, negative because, you know, uh, it, it, it it tends to blur uh, precisely what constitutes the Pontiana. You know, it's, it's very unclear as to um, what the parameters of the Pontiana is, you know, what's, what are the demarcating uh, features of the Pontiana. But I think it, it's positive in the sense that because the Pontiana is so ambiguous, it allows for all kinds of reimagination to be possible. So the Pontiana becomes something of a, of a, uh, of a, uh, uh, a cipher, a kind of a, a floating signifier that can that can accommodate all kinds of uh, significances, all kinds of meanings um, for ideological purposes, which is precisely what um, Pontianak films in the 20th and the 21st century have attempted to do, to use the Pontianak figure in order to promote certain ideology uh, that ultimately is ambiguous because the ideologies are uh, quite dualistic on one hand, does the ideology support the status quo or does the ideology challenge the status quo? Uh, because of the ambiguity that surrounds the Pontiana as a signifier, it becomes difficult to pinpoint precisely what loyalties the Pontiana uh, is, uh, is uh, showing. Is it showing loyalty to the status quo or loyalty uh, uh, to an ideology that is basically threatening the status quo? Um, right. So, in that sense, the monstrous family of Southeast Asia, it play an anachronistic function. So, on one hand, they are creatures that reflect a worldview or an ideology of cosmogony um, that, that belongs to the animistic past of, uh, of this region. But on the other hand, they are also uh, floating signifiers that, that, that um, um, filmmakers, for example, are able to use to promote all kinds of um, uh, interesting modern post-colonial meanings uh, that are meaningful to the respective countries and to the to the Southeast Asian in general. Uh, uh, so, in that sense, they are anachronistic. Uh, is there any questions that I can take for now, or shall I move on? Shall I just move on then? Okay, cool. So, uh, for the next uh, for the next few minutes, I suppose, how are we now? I'm just going to talk about some of the films uh, that have been produced in this part of the world uh, in relation to the monstrous feminine. Um, and by talking about these films, I hope to show how um, 20th and 21st century have reimagined the monstrous feminine for different ideological reasons that are, are pertinent or that are pertinent or respective to uh, the countries uh, in which the films are produced. Because um, the different countries have used this monstrous feminine to promote the idea of nation building in different ways. Um, so, in the case of Ireland, I'll just look at two. Um, the first is Mina Prakanong, which is uh, 
reportedly the first horror film made in Thailand, one of the earliest horror films uh, in this part of the world. And the more more recent one, which is Nang Nat in 99. Now, the two films, when you compare them, they're interesting because in Mina Prakanong, uh, the, the monster feminine figure, the woman who becomes the monstrous feminine is essentially a woman who is uh, immoral. So she's, she's, uh, she's, she's basically a, a loose woman, uh, a woman who, has, uh, uh, who, who is more interested in, in uh, enticing men. And so when she, she dies at childbirth and becomes uh, uh, the, the monstrous feminine, um, it's a kind of a punishment. Um, and therefore, uh, the monstrous family in this in this film is ideologically a woman, basically, uh, who is uh, who is who who embodies what uh, a Thai woman. Basically, she embodies everything a Thai woman should not be emulating. She is the she's the anti uh, Thai woman, as opposed to, for example, the woman who turns into the creature in the 1999 version. Um, here. She becomes, uh, she becomes the, mon the monstrous feminine because she refuses to give up uh, her existence with her husband, who at the time of her death was at war. So she gives birth uh, and she dies along with her child while the husband was away. But because of her great love for her husband and because she wants to continue serving the husband as, uh, as a good wife, she creates this illusory world for the husband to come home, uh, and and, uh, and 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 will she will only she will destroy anybody who attempts to to uh, to to uh, well to destroy the illusory world that she's created and, and to prevent her from being with the husband. So in that sense, Nang Na, the the second film, um, promotes a monstrous feminine who is really not a monster at, at at all, but a woman who, out of her deep devotion to her husband, um. Uh, refuses to die so that she can go on serving her husband, being the good and perfect wife that uh, that is uh, that a Thai woman um, should be. And in that sense, she therefore embodies what would be the Thai woman par excellence. She's the perfect Thai woman. Uh, she's the Thai woman that uh, that uh, that every other Thai woman should emulate. Um, and you know, Nana was made in a time when uh, Asia was going through a financial crisis, and uh, and so. It become, the film becomes a, a way of shoring up uh, a kind of cultural authenticity or a cultural identity uh, against Western sort of attacks. So Nangna becomes a film that uh, props up what uh, a purist or, or, or an ideal Thai uh, uh, identity is, you know, uh, that one that is not, uh, that has not been sort of corrupted by the West, that's not been contaminated by its, uh, 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 by its contact with the West. Because the film is set um, it, uh, in the, uh, I think, the 18th century during the reign of Rama V. So in, in the film, this Nangna, she, really, she is meant to represent the actual uh, figure in history who would become Nangna. So it is set in also the, the time, uh, the, the historical period when uh, the actual Nangna, the actual Nangna, the actual uh, uh, Nangna in history uh, had lived. Um, so, and Nangna in many ways was also different uh, from many of the uh, Thai uh, films. There are, there are many, many Nangna films made in Thai. Okay, almost every decade, there are two or three Nangna films beginning 1959. Okay? But the 1999 one is different from all the others because of its high production qualities, uh, because of, its, uh, of the, all the, the, the amount of care that has gone into the creation of the film uh, in order to sort of uh, demonstrate to an international market what being Thai is all about, what being uh, Thai in its, unique, in its uniqueness, what, what embodies the perfect Thai woman, what is the good Thai individual. Um, and there are other things that also set uh, Nangna apart from the other sort of uh, firms uh, made in Thailand re revolving around the uh, monstrous feminine, one of which is the, uh, the final showdown between uh, the monster and the Buddhist monk. So in a lot of uh, uh, Mena or Nang Nak films, uh, there's all, all, all these Mena and Nang Nak films, they almost invariably end with a showdown scene between the monster and the monk, uh, the Buddhist monk. And the whole point, of course, in that scene is to reify the supremacy of the Buddhist religion because the B Buddhism will always win. So the monk will come and he, um, there will be a battle and the monk will finally exorcise uh, the, the, the monster and the monster will be defeated. But in Nangna, what is interesting is that there is no battle scene. In fact, there is a conversation. 
between the monster and and the and the monk and the monk convinces the monster that she has to go because she's because in this world of the living she is she no longer belongs um, and she needs to let her husband go and she she cannot keep on uh, creating this illusion because remember in in Hindu in in Buddhism there's this idea of uh, of uh, of it's an idea that is similar to Hinduism about you know how how there is how ultimately desire is illusory so you have to let that go, um, but but what's interesting is it is based on this res mutual respect between the monster and the monk that finally convinces the monster that she has to leave. So there was no battle, uh, and, and 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 while there is this idea that you know it again reifies the supremacy of Buddhism, it also suggests that. Buddhism here is negotiating with an alternative worldview rather than subjugating the alternative worldview. So it's as if Buddhism survives because it has to negotiate its position with an alternative worldview rather than you know uh, showing its great power and supremacy in you know uh, suppressing and finally defeating this alternative view worldview as is often shown in uh, previous sort of uh, Nangna or Mena films um, and. Nana ends with um, with the husband of of, of the monsters uh, family entering into the Buddhist uh, into into Buddhism into the into the Buddhist order, and so in that sense you also have uh, the monster sort of providing or presenting the order with a gift of her husband by having him enter into the sangha or the or the Buddhist community, um, and that. It, it, that in, in Thailand, that that actually raises the status of of of. of I mean, in Thailand, when a woman uh, bears sons and then later on uh, allows the son to enter into the Buddhist community, into the into into monkhood, that actually raises the status of the woman uh, in, in Thai culture because it shows uh, her her deep devotion to the faith. So in Nangna, although she doesn't have a child to give to the uh, to the uh, to to monk uh, to enter into monkhood, the fact that her husband enters the monkhood is is a kind of a is a kind of a indirect uh, representation of her her high status uh, of womanhood in Thai culture because at the end of the day, while she may not have a child to give to the to the uh, to the to the uh, order, she she allows uh, she uh, because of her actions and because. Uh, of, of her of her decision in the end to to uh to to let go of the living um that that convinces her husband to enter into uh into uh the order to serve the order for the rest of his existence so in that sense her husband's entry into the order also uh also uh, raises the status of of the monstrous feminine figure so you can see how in the two firms, the 1959 and the 1999 one, while the first firm sets up the woman who will turn into a monstrous family as, you know, uh, uh, in, as an immoral woman who is punished by turning her into an undead creature who then subsequently causes destruction and havoc because she's evil. Um, in the Nang Nat version, you have a woman who turns undead because of her great devotion to her husband and in the end, through negotiation and mutual respect with Buddhism, Finally, lets her husband go in order for the husband to then move on to the next stage of his life, even as she also moves on uh, to the next stage of her life. So it's a, it's a it's a, it's more of a love story rather than a story, than a horror story. Um, and it's it's a story ultimately about Buddhism's um, supremacy, but a supremacy that is achieved through negotiation with other worldview, as opposed to in. Mena Prakanong and many other Nana uh, films that came after that, where the supremacy is rich uh, because of you know uh, a show of uh, of, of power uh, that ultimately subjugates uh, any other alternative or threatening uh, worldview um, that that exists within the Thai uh, imaginary. That's uh, the Thai uh, way of that is how Thai films uh, have envisioned the monstrous feminine and promoted it for ideological purposes. In order to reify uh, the idea of Thainess uh, that is uh, authentic, that is uh, different, that is uncontaminated or untouched by Westernization, uh, that uh, that continues to uh, uh, um, uphold the idea of uh, the pure Thai woman, the uh, Thai woman par excellence through the configuration of the monstrous feminine. I uh, have all seen Nangna. It's actually very very well known. I think you can. I think you probably can get it 
on YouTube, but it's a it's a very it's a very good film, honestly. Um, okay, in Malaysia now, Malaysia's case is it's interesting in a sense. Now, Malaysia doesn't have that many uh, Pontianak films when you compare it to Thailand, for example. It's got um, a Pontianak film uh, for every de decade beginning the 50s right up until the 70s. So there are Pontianak films in the 50s, and there's Pontianak films in the 60s, there is one Pontianak film in the 70s, and then there was no Pontianak film anymore for the next 30 years. In fact, there are no horror films in Malaysia anymore from 1974 right up to 2004. So for, for 30 years, there was an unofficial ban in Malaysia uh, when it comes to the production of horror films. Um, and not many people know this actually, but if you chart the uh, kinds of films Malaysia made um, uh, in, the, in the past um, 70, 80 years, you can see a distinct uh, absence of horror films made in this, in this uh, time period. There was one horror film made in 1981, but that film although it, it uh, bears the title uh, that suggests a monstrous creature, the film is really more a psychological thriller. It's, there's, there's no sort of a monster character. It's more of uh, a family that, uh, that's trying to destroy each other. So they use you know, scare tactics, you know, but there really isn't, uh, a, 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 there's no haunting, there's no ghost, there's no monster. So that was the last of the, ho of the uh, horror film in apostrophe in, in uh, Fort Marx. Um, but, Horror films really ended with the 1974 version of the Pontiana. So what's interesting about the Malaysian Pontiana films is the very first films that were made in Malaysia when Malaysia gained independence in 1957 were Pontiana films. So in 1957, when Malaysia became independent, the first films that Malaysia made were films re re relating to the monstrous family. So there were two of them. Or rather, there were three. It's a trilogy. Unfortunately, the first and the third one are permanently lost. Uh, they, they're gone forever. Apparently, somebody threw them into some tin mine um, river and it's gone. So only the second one is left and you have to sort of uh, make certain inferences uh, from the second one as to what the first and the third one is all about. But, so, but, but in the 50s, there were other, uh, 58, 59, there were other Pontiana uh, films made. Then in the 60s, there were two. And in the 70s, there was one. Uh, the last horror film made in Malaysia before the ban was a Pontianak film. So the first film that came out of Malaysia after Malaysia gained independence were Pontianak films. The last film, the last horror film that Malaysia made before uh, uh, horror film was banned was a Pontianak film. And when horror film came back to Malaysia in 2004, I mean, sorry, when horror films were made again uh, in Malaysia beginning 2004, it was again a Pontianak film. So the Pontianak seems to have a very uh, special place amongst Malaysians uh, when it comes to uh, the sort of folk creature of this part of the world. Somehow Malaysians tend to have an affinity with especially this particular uh, uh, monstrous figure, you know, as opposed to the, the many, many other sort of uh, monstrous figures from mythology uh, that, uh, that we have in this part of the world. And Malaysia actually has many different types of uh, uh, monsters. For example, we have the Palisid and we have the Penanggalan, we have the Pochong and the Polong and, 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 and many others, but somehow it's the Pontiana that has, uh, that has fascinated uh, Malaysians, uh, especially in, the, in, in relation to films for the last 50, 60, 70 years, so much so that uh, most of our horror films tend to revolve around this particular monstrous creature uh, as opposed to the others. So, so in the 1950s, so, so it's interesting. So if we look at the Pontiana films in a kind of a, from a sort of a Freudian perspective, I would say, you know, so Malaysia, you know, as, as, a, as the, the whole sort of a um, independent sort of scenario is suggestive of a sort of a, a pre, a, a Oedipal sort of a, con, a contention whereby uh, the, the newborn sort of uh, child, which is Malaysia, is still unable to entirely let go of the maternal other that exists uh, prior to the Oedipalization. So the maternal other is this, the, 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 the animistic past of Malaysia, the, the pre-Oedipal past of Malaysia that somehow will not let the child go. And so um, it becomes repressed and it haunts in the margins of the Malaysian culture and imaginary through films um, in the 50s and the 60s until finally in the 70s when a very powerful sort of a father figure entered into the Malaysian scenario, which is uh, our 
previous Prime Minister, uh, Mahathir Mohamad. I'm not sure if you know this man, but he is the longest serving Prime Minister in, I think, Malaysia, probably even the world, longer than Lee Kuan Yew. Um, and um, and uh, he, his, 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 uh, uh, his, um, his coming into into office as the prime minister um, changed his. Uh, I mean, Mahathir is widely known as the father of modern Malaysia, and when he became the prime minister in 1973, 1974 would be the year when you know horror film would find would 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 be finally uh, laid to rest for the next 30 years. So you can see how you know with the coming of this very powerful uh, father figure, uh, the maternal other, i.e., the Pontiana figure also becomes repressed. And if she will be repressed for the next 30 years until 2004, when Mahathir Muhammad steps down from being the Prime Minister. So when he became the Prime Minister, it's also the time when the Pontiana, stock, Pontiana firms uh, uh, ended its history in this part of the world. And when he steps down from being Prime Minister in 2003, in 2004, the Pontiana firm comes back. So as long as Malaysia had this very powerful father figure in charge of the country, the maternal other had no voice. The, the moment he steps down, the maternal other in the form of the Pontiana figure, the monstrous family comes back. So the monstrous family, you can use it. She, she can be seen as a kind of a thermometer that measures the extent to which uh, the paternal uh, uh, the, pattern, the, the sort of Freudian paternal uh, super ego sort of father is in charge of, of uh, the uh, of, of the of the scenario in, of the sort of a uh, psycho uh, psychoanalytical scenario in this country. Uh, so in the fifties, as I mentioned, um, the Pontiana films uh, were introduced uh, in, in Malaysia, and in the sixties, while there were Pontiana films being made, the sixties Pontiana films were more like uh, were, were more ideological rather than actual horror films. So the, in the 60s, the, the firms are uh, uh, revolving around the Pontiana. There really are no real Pontiana in the firms. There are more women who are transgressive, women who refuse to get married, women who refuse to bear children, women basically who are not participating or contributing to nation building. So in these firms, they are the Pontiana. So they are not, they are, in these firms, there are no real monstrous feminine uh, as in, uh, in uh, as in you know, creatures of the folklore haunting uh, the scenarios of the firms. There are more women who, because they refuse to contribute to nation building, they become labeled as metaphorical Pontianas. And in the 70s, uh, there is a single Pontiana firm. It's a very poor quality firm. Uh, it's a, in fact, it's a it's a it's a firm that I would strongly recommend that you don't watch because it's pretty bad. Um, but it's good as it, it, it's a it's a good firm in terms of a cult plus. I suppose it's not a cult. It's more of a cult uh, thing right now rather than a firm that people watch because it's got aesthetic aesthetic excellence. Um, and it's also it's, it's it's significant in the history of uh, Malaysian Pontiana films because it's the last Pontiana film uh, prior to the ban in horror. Right. Um, so. Um, so for the next 30 years, there will be no more Pontiana firms. And as I said, in 2004, the year after Martin Mohamed steps down as the Prime Minister, Pontiana firm will come back. And it will come back with a vengeance because the 2004 uh, Pontiana firm, which is uh, Pontiana Harum Sindar Malang or Pontiana of the, uh, of the uh, Cuba Rose, uh, is uh, uh, purportedly the, the best Pontiana firm uh, ever made. You know, it's won a lot of local as well as international awards. Um, and it's, it, 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 it uh, draws on many of the tropes of the earlier Pontiana firms, but also introduces new ones. And it, has to, and it was done with a lot of uh, prohibition in place. So for example, um, in order for the firm to be made and released, you know, the, the director had to walk a very fine line and had to sort of... Uh, adhere to a lot of censorship um, regulations that were put in place um, because uh, horror films were essentially banned in this part of the world and so she's trying to reintroduce horror film into into the market into the local market so the director who is a who is a feminist had to be very careful in terms of what she she does with the film so she, for example there can be no scenes of uh, 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 the the undead rising from the grave. Uh, at the end of the day, the firm has to reify the supremacy of Islam. Uh, no excessive gore, no possession scenes. So there were all these sort of criteria, and yet, you know, uh, despite that, the firm managed to come up with something that is uh, truly amazing and uh, very very effective as a horror film. Uh, and since uh, the time uh, of uh, the, the the 2004. Uh, Pontiana firm. There have been many, many, many Pontiana firms. They've made in uh, of varying quality, right? Some which are very good, some 
which are just not very good because because uh, now that the ban is over, uh, suddenly there was this uh, explosion of horror films from this part of the world because I suppose horror films are, are they make money. So there have been a lot of them, and also because of the uh, the K and J uh, horror sort of uh, success. So a lot of Southeast Asian uh, nations like for instance, like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand wanted to jump into the band uh, jump into the bandwagon of creating horror films for an international market. So there's this explosion of horror films from this part of the world, as I say, in varying qualities. But certainly some of the earlier Pontiana films that were released directly after this, uh, after the Prime Minister Mahadima stepped down were some of the better or the best Pontiana films made in this part of the world. There's a sequel to the 2004 Pontiana film, which is uh, which is made in 2005. A, a, a lot more experimental in many ways, but uh, equally interesting. Um, Singapore had produced one Pontiana film. Um, uh, but, but before I go on to Singapore, so you, in, in a case of Malaysia, you can see how the Pontiana films, they, the, the, the firms serve very interesting sort of dualistic ideologies. On one hand, these firms uh, reify the idea that the Pontiana is a creature of, uh, of a mythical past, that has to be disavowed. Um, that has uh, that that has no place in uh, modern Malaysia or Malaysia that is increasingly modernized. But on the other hand, um, these Pontianak films, over and over again, they do not uh, they do not uh, showcase a, a monster that is ultimately evil. All right. So in the 1950s, for example, the Pontianaks. Uh, they 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 can assume human uh, identities. Um, and when they are humans, they play human roles. So, for example, they can get married, they can have children, um, and they only turn into monsters because they are trying to protect their family. So, they are actually quite heroic in the sense. And so, so these are these are monstrous families who are who are monsters only because they are trying to uh, protect their loved ones from being, you know, destroyed by another monster. In fact, one of the one of the Pontiana films of the 1950s pitted the Pontiana against another uh, creature of folklore um, because this other creature of folklore threatened to destroy the child of the of the Pontiana. Um, so and in the uh, and in the six so so in that sense you have you have a kind of a competing ideology happening here. At the end of the day the Pontiana of course have to leave because they have no place in in Malaysia in the 50s, which is a modern Malaysia. Malaysia is independent. It has, it's got no place in the post-colonial nation. So after all the, the, the uh, sort of a conflict has been resolved, the Pontian has to go away. You know, she, she cannot remain anymore. Um, so in that sense, it suggests that there is no place for uh, a, a, a creature from myth like this to exist uh, in, in a time when, when Malaysia has achieved independence and is moving on towards modernity. But on the other hand, because these creatures are not painted in evil colors, uh, it suggests that, you know, that, that the idea of uh, a competing worldview in some ways still exists. So Islam has not been able to completely demonize these creatures to the extent that they are, they have, they are completely forgotten or they are written off as uh, purely evil, uh, but uh, there there seems to be some kind of a uh, indirect uh, indirect uh, re uh, reification or rather uh, indirect uh, recognition, sorry, of this alternative worldview that is still competing with Islam. So you can see how these films, on one hand, seem to uh, challenge the status quo, but on the other hand, also reify the status quo. Um, um, as opposed to the 60s films, which ultimately is meant to challenge the status quo, I'm sorry, to reify the status quo by having uh, not so much uh, actual Pontianak appearing in films, but women who are figurative Pontianak because they refuse to submit to uh, the nation's uh, an, a nation building agenda. Uh, but in the 2000s, the Pontianak films again, you know, uh, resume that sort of dualistic ideology in the sense that on one hand, uh, the Pontianak figure is a monstrous creature who is out to de destroy uh, the living, but on the other hand, they are also monstrous creatures out to destroy the living because they have been wronged and they are seeking justice. So, uh, and so in the in the two thousand and four uh, Pontiana film, uh, the the first film that was made after the ban was lifted, it revolves around a dancer who was killed because the person wanted to take her her property. 
And so she turns, so in, in life, as a woman, she had little power. So in that, she is able to accrue power uh, uh, by, by turning into this monstrous family in order to seek justice. So it's, she's not out for revenge. She's more out uh, to, to get her killer to return her property and to admit that he has, he has committed uh, a, a terrible crime. Um, so the whole idea of, uh, of the revenge motive is only sort of, uh, is, is sort of indirect rather than uh, the actual sort of premise for the film. So again, it's a dualistic ideology. Of course, she is a monster from folklore, but the film does not represent this monster as ultimately evil, but more of a, 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 more of a, a creature that is out to seek justice for the wrong that's been done to her. So in that sense, again, you have a firm that seems to defy Islam's uh, prohibition of such creatures because in Islam, such creatures sh should not even exist because in Islam, the idea is that if the Quran doesn't, uh, doesn't sort of talk about them, then they don't exist. Uh, so, but obviously, you know, with, with firms like this, there is a suggestion that the uh, ideology, that the ideology, uh, uh, the ideology that is based on the cosmogony prior to the time of Islam still very much uh, uh, remains in the cultural imaginary of this part of the world. It's not completely uh, dismissed or, or exorcised, but it's still very much, uh, it's, uh, it's still very much uh, influenced the, the way in which uh, this part of the world thinks and interact with uh, the otherworldly, I suppose. And in Singapore, the, the, there was only one Pontiana poem ever made, and that was written to Pontiana in 2001. And Singapore's use of the Pontiana basically is to disavow uh, its historical past with Malaysia. So Singapore and Malaysia, as some of you know, were once a single country until 1965 when there was a separation. And since then, Singapore has always sort of uh, uh, identified itself as a country as other from Malaysia. So in uh, so whatever Singapore is today is because it's not Malaysia. So the, that's a sort of the underlying idea. And so in a firm like Return to Pontiana, you have the idea of how you know um, uh, uh, how you know in order to keep Singapore uh, uh, uncontaminated by its Malaysian past, you, know, you can have you should not have anything to do with with that Malaysian past. So in the story, you have a group of youngsters going back to to a Malaysian state, and because of that, you know, one by one, they become uh, haunted and possessed by the Pontiana. So the the underlying idea is that you know in order to dis in order to uh, in order to sort of uh, prop up your Singaporean identity, you must not allow your 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 history with Malaysia to impact on your identity because it can it can sort of uh, uh, compromise uh, how you how you uh, how you see yourself as a Singaporean or as as a Singaporean. The, uh, and of course, that's metaphor for how Singapore is trying to uh, continue. I mean, Singapore to this very day, you know. Uh, sets itself up as a national identity that is other from Malaysia. And finally, Indonesia, I'll just quickly uh, talk about Indonesia. Indonesia is interesting because although the Pontiana, the, the monstrous feminine character um, or figure has long been part of its uh, folklore, um, there's almost no record um, of its uh, presence in uh, recorded history until the two, until 2018 film. And the 2018 film, in many ways, is not uh, in any way reflective of the creature in mythology. There's very little in the film that you see uh, that will tell you what the Kuntilana of mythology actually is, because the Kuntilana in the film has been so uh, greatly uh, uh, re, re, re envisioned or revised, you know, uh, with a lot of Western ideas sort of appended to it that it no longer reflects uh, the creature of mythology in any distinct way. Um, so for example, the whole idea of the, the, the creature being an undead, you know, uh, uh, because of uh, a, a botched uh, childbearing is completely uh, uh, absent in the, in the film. Uh, in fact, the Kunti Lana is a, is a tree spirit that uh, somehow comes, uh, comes to haunt a hostel through a series of mirrors which are all elements that are completely alien to the mythology. Uh, and in the film, the Kuntinana film of 2018, there's a lot more Western elements, like for example, the, uh, the, 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 um, the figure of the final girl that you find in slasher films uh, being sort of uh, uh, applied to the Kuntinana 
uh, the Indonesian film of 2018, and you have um, you have um, the the creature more. I mean, represented more as uh, a, an embodiment of a mangled uh, corpse rather than you know uh, the kind of mythological creature that you will find in. Uh, Firms from Malaysia or even Thailand, you know, a beautiful woman who can transform into this uh, horrible uh, uh, winged monster that is out for for blood you know, of their victims. Um, so, in that sense, there's very little I can to say about the Kuntilana version of 2018. I mean, the, the, the Kuntilana uh, film uh, of 2018 because, as I said, there's very little reference to the actual mythology in the film. Uh, the, the film, the, only the title tells you that it is based on mythology, and but really the film is, has very little to do with the mythology of the, uh, of the monstrous family from Southeast Asia uh, whatsoever. So um, with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. I hope it's been helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah great thank you so much um i see that some people got the time zones wrong that's okay um uh, there was a couple of questions that were coming okay. up as we went through um let me have a check where they were from um frank did you have a question not really um, and Jan had a question that's interested to learn if Southeast Asian folklore can be considered Gothic. Well, I've always had a problem with the, the term Gothic as applied to, you know, uh, outside the sort of Anglo-American canon. Um, because the word Gothic seems to be synonymous with horror nowadays. Um, um, so if you ask me, I think then there needs to be some definition or a redefinition of the Gothic so that it can encompass non-Anglo-American um, material uh, rather, rather than just impose the term uh, across rather than impose the term across, uh, across cultures. But I think it's possible. I mean, for me, I see Gothic more of a, of, as a form of an aesthetic. It's a, it's a way of expressing uh, the unspeakable, expressing things that are not easily spoken about because of the sort of taboo issues that they deal with. So it's a, it's a kind of a vocabulary, a kind of a language, a kind of a means by which we can then talk about forbidden things. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I see Gothic. For me, as I said, Gothic is more of an aesthetic rather than a genre. And so by looking at Gothic as primarily an aesthetic, then I think it can be then applied to across cultures um, as opposed to looking at it purely as a genre, which would then limit it to just the Anglo-American sort of a canon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Jan, I don't know if you were asking a question there. We couldn't really hear you. There was just a lot of interference. But if you wanted to clarify or, or ask, you can try again or write in the chat. Um, so sorry, that's why I popped you on mute, just because we couldn't really hear what you were saying. Um, there's a couple of other questions there, starting from Alkisti, I think. I don't know if you can see. Okay, are there any novels or stories with this? Um, there, there is a Malaysian writer, his name is Tunku Halim. He's written some stories about the Pontianak. But unfortunately, Tunku Halim is more of a, uh, he's more of a bestseller type of writer. So he, he actually imposes a lot of Western ideas onto the local monster. So one of the things he does, for example, is uh, one of the things that 20th century uh, Pontiana film has done over and over again, and that is impose uh, features of the Western vampire onto the Pontiana. So the Pontiana has fangs, uh, it, it, it's on blood, which are all completely alien to the actual mythology. Um, so, but he's the only one sort of writing about the Pontiana. Um, so if you're asking for actual written works uh, dealing with this type of monsters, uh, he's the only one. Unfortunately, because I think you, there's a lot better things that can be done with, with local folklore creatures than, you know, uh, giving them Western uh, qualities in order to sell books. There's a 
a couple of other questions as well. Oh, okay. Uh, what was the title? Oh, the title of the uh, the one that, that was released after the bank is Pontianak Harum Sundar Malam. Uh, I think I'll type it down here. Thank you. Which uh, translates, uh, sorry, which translates to uh, Huh. Interesting. Sorry, no, not, not 1004, 2004. Let's see. 2004, oh my goodness. I'm not using my computer, so I might type my, my having problem typing. Okay, that should be right. And then the uh,